everyone. Welcome to the Capitalized Podcast, formerly known as the Hard Money Podcast. My name is Chris Casella, and as always, this episode is brought to you by our private lending company, Sharper Capital Partners. You can learn more about us and what we do at sharpercapitalpartners.com. And just as a quick note, this is our first episode since we rebranded from the Hard Money Podcast to the Capitalized Podcast. And the reason we decided to rebrand is because while we are private lenders or hard money lenders, we want to have conversations that bring value to all kinds of real estate investors because we work with all kinds of real estate investors. And we felt like we were pigeonholing ourselves a little bit with the name centered around hard money. And I'm excited about this rebranding because it means we get to have conversations with a wide range of people throughout the industry. And I'm particularly excited about this episode because today I'm having a conversation with Sam Moore. Sam is the owner of Goosehead Insurance, the Moore agency in Columbus, Ohio, which is an independent insurance agency with a strong emphasis in all types of residential real estate. Sam, thanks a lot for being here. Chris, it's great to be here. Thanks for asking. Of course. So before we dive into some of the technical stuff, if you wouldn't mind, if you could just tell us a little bit about your background and how you ended up actually owning your own agency today. Yeah. So my career has mostly been in commercial banking and commercial insurance and a very niche field. My, my background is international finance and international risk management. But I transitioned to personal lines insurance about five years ago. And what I really love about personal lines is that you, know, you just get to work very closely with people. Typically, um, you know, it's just on their, their home and auto insurance, things that matter to them at a personal level. Uh, in my agency, we have a particular focus also on investment properties. Uh, that is a, a niche that we've um, we've taken a deeper dive into, and that broadens our scope to include uh, not just individuals, but also you know LLCs and other kinds of uh, partnerships. And um, you know, one to four family is mostly what we do, but uh, we do more than four family also. But my background in kind of finance and insurance is a, a terrific kind of uh, stage setter for what I'm doing now. Awesome. I appreciate it. And could you shed a little bit more light on what personal lines are and how they relate to real estate, just to be clear? Personal lines insurance is any kind of insurance that is undertaken personally, as opposed to in the name of a business. Awesome. Perfect. I appreciate the clarification. So there's a lot that I want to talk about, and you and I were discussing a little bit before we, we started recording. There's a few things we want to cover. So the first thing I want to talk about are the different kinds of coverage that real estate investors are going to need, depending on which kind of project they're undertaking. So the first one I want to talk about is, let's say someone wants to get into real estate investing, and they want to start by simply renting out a single family home. What kind of insurance are they going to need to be protected in that case? Sure. So... Landlord insurance is the trade kind of name for your typical insurance policy that it covers uh, a single family residence or a duplex up to four family. Uh, that's referred to as uh, landlord insurance. Okay. And is landlord insurance a catch-all policy? Are there additional pieces of insurance that they're going to need? So there's different forms of landlord insurance depending on on the uh, property that it covers. But typically, it is a kind of package policy that includes both protection for the property and liability of the property owner. The property insurance includes and focuses mostly on the structure itself, both outside and inside. So the, the walls, uh, the... The exterior, you know, we're asking all the same questions as we would with a homeowner's policy. Is it brick? Is it vinyl? Is it wood? Uh, what kind of roof is there? But um, what what kind of uh, uh, things are there that are attached? You know, is there a deck? Is there an attached garage? Is there a detached garage? Um, you know, the type of roof really matters. Uh, so all those things are, are are included in the in the landlord policy. And then the inside, the inner walls, uh, the flooring, the ceilings, the things that are fixed to the dwelling itself. So cabinets, uh, bath fixtures, uh, kitchen fixtures, that kind of thing. Okay. So within landlord insurance, 
uh, what I'm hearing is you have a dwelling coverage, right? You're, the dwelling itself, the building itself is covered under a landlord policy. That's correct. That's, that's the main focus. Uh, there's some limited amount of coverage for what might be deemed personal property, things that the landlord owns that are not fixed to the structure. Uh, uh, some appliances can fall into that category, uh, but it, it's just things kept on premises for the servicing of the premises. Okay, perfect. And can we dive into liability insurance and another kind of addition to that umbrella insurance as well? Yeah, so uh, liability is something that every property owner faces and it protects against claims of negligence attributable to the state of the property, typically the upkeep of the property. Uh, there's lots of examples of that. One that I like to use is, you know, a, a handrail comes loose from a wall, somebody's leaning on it, and the tenant or their guest falls down the steps. Uh, that could be deemed to be landlord negligence due to improper upkeep. Same could be for like railing around a, um, a deck or a front porch. Uh, but one that's also uh, present is mold. Um, landlords that um, you know have a property where mold is growing and the tenants get sick can be li uh, liable for uh, those those losses or injuries suffered by the, the tenants. Mm. And so where does umbrella insurance fall into this? So umbrella is uh, kind of the trade name for excess liability coverage. So liability coverage begins with what's offered and included in the landlord policy. Typically, I mean, I don't, I don't sell insurance, uh, a policy with liability less than $500,000, but it, it could be as little as $100,000. Some forms of landlord insurance uh, start at zero and you add, add on from there. Um, but the, the cost of liability insurance uh, included in a policy is, is, is pretty affordable. But um, umbrella insurance is recommended, um, or I recommend it to my clients that own more than one property because your exposure to liability is just amplified uh, with, with more you know, properties that you own. So if, um, if there should be a loss that exceeds the liability limit on your landlord policy, that's where an umbrella policy's limits would then kick in. That's a great distinction. I appreciate that. And that was one of the questions that I had was, does your insurance policy that you need change if you add an additional rental property to your portfolio? So um, I would just say it, it amplifies or multiplies um, and in that way it changes, but the nature of the risk uh, is the same. Okay, great. So there's a couple of other things that I did wanna ask. And the first one is, is there a way to cover if somebody that you're renting to has pets, right? There's a different amount of damage or a different type of damage that you might be um, opening yourself up to if you rent to somebody who has pets. Is that something that the landlord themselves might have to consider for their policy? That's a great question. And it is a question on most insurance applications. Uh, does the tenant or does the landlord have knowledge of a tenant that has pets? And more specifically, dogs, uh, breeds of dogs that appear on a, on a list. So these are dogs that are statistically more likely to result in a liability claim. So the ones you might normally think of pit bulls and Rottweilers and Dobermans and, and um, uh, similar type of breeds. Uh, one thing to note is that not every carrier's uh, breed list is the same. Uh, some carriers have a bite history criterion instead of a breed criterion. Um, but if you're a landlord, my advice is, you know, if you don't know, if your tenants have a dog, make it your business to find out um, because you don't want a situation where uh, your tenant has a dog that injures someone and it might not just be a bite. Um, it could be that they knock somebody down. You know, I've heard of a case where a, a dog frightened a small child and ran out into a busy street, you know, just really, really awful scenarios. And um, uh, so it's the liability part of the policy that engages that risk. So, um, 
you know, the, the landlord may not have any control over, you know, a, a dog that frightens a small child. But, you know, when somebody is facing loss and in the hands of a personal injury attorney that goes searching for um, pockets of financial resources, that landlord could get drawn into a claim and you want to have, uh, you know, a good amount of liability insurance to protect you if that happens. Absolutely. Absolutely. The next piece I was curious about is what is renter's insurance and why does it matter if you own a rental property that renter's insurance is in place? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, if I'm a landlord, I'm having renter's insurance, I'm keeping a policy on file and I'm making a notation of the renewal date. And as part of my regular check-in with the tenant, I want an updated uh, copy whenever that renews. Um, that is your first line of defense against liability claims. So making sure that your tenant has uh, liability protection gives you a layer of protection against that personal injury lawyer seeking that, that uh, deeper pocket. Um, and it also, um, it's just good practice for your renters. It, it protects their personal property. If, if the unit above them, you know, has a leaky toilet and it ruins their clothes, they can claim on their, uh, they can claim on the renter's policy. If they can't live in the unit because it's been damaged by fire or burst pipes or something like that, and you as a landlord need your tenants to vacate, uh, while the repairs are being made, a renter's insurance policy provides what's called loss of use coverage for the renter. And it typically it's, you know, six to 10, I've seen it as high as $20,000 uh, on a renter's policy. So it gives them resources to find another place to live while those repairs happen. So it's really important to have your tenants uh, obtain renter's insurance. That's really helpful. And it, it, uh, it brought up another point that I think is important to cover as well. So from the renter's perspective, renter's insurance covers them in case they don't have somewhere to live. They need to find somewhere else, right? Something happens to their, their primary dwelling. They need to find somewhere else to live up to somewhere, let's say $20,000. Now from the landlord's perspective, there's something similar, if I understand correctly, called loss of income insurance. Could you talk a little bit about, about that? And it seems, you know, maybe it's obvious importance, but just what you've seen and why you think it's so important. Sure. If your renter can't live in your in your uh, in your dwelling that you rent to them because it's being repaired, part of of your loss associated with that property is the loss of rent. So you can include that in your calculation of loss when you make your claim to the insurance company. Um, as the agent, I want to know, and so I ask in the in the discovery call, you know, how much rent are you charging? And then, you know, we'll multiply that by 12 and, and we'll set the loss of use uh, figure at that amount. And we can build in a little bit of buffer, um, you know, in case rents change and you forget to tell people, uh, tell your insurance agent, you know, we, we build that in, so. Sure. And then one of the last things here uh, that I was curious about, and I think is important for people to know, how much can somebody expect to pay for all the coverage that they should have in place in order to own a single family rental? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a question every person is interested in. You, know, you, you wanna make sure that you're not paying more than you need to, but I like to make sure we're always starting with getting the coverage right. And so getting the coverage right is making sure the dwelling is properly valued, um, you know, which is, arriving at, a, at a, an appropriate cost per square foot because that's the way the, the dwelling value is established. Um, so let's make sure that you're properly valued. Um, you know, most policies are reconstruction cost. Some landlords, uh, if they have a particularly low price point uh, property that they've purchased, it may cost a lot more to rebuild than they paid to purchase it. And they may be interested in an actual cash value policy which I only recommend for people whose eyes are wide open, really wide open, because uh, it's more than do you get your, your value back in the event of a total loss. It can affect how claims are settled for parcel losses as well. Uh, so you start with the dwelling value, replacement cost, actual cash value, um, loss of use, personal property. And then you have uh, things that 
maybe aren't as top of mind, uh, like water backup losses in a basement, you know, that experiences backflow from the sewer. Are you properly covered for that? Is it enough? Um, that's an optional coverage and it has a specific premium associated with it that correlates to the amount of coverage that you choose. So that's an important conversation. You know, if you, if you don't have good coverage for that, you could have an unanticipated hit to your cash flow from that property. So you want to make sure that you're protected. And then uh, the roof, uh, roof age is really important. Uh, the older the roof, the less you're going to get for it in a claim settlement. So just have a really uh, direct conversation with your agent about that. You know, when you're getting into the policy, a lot of times it's hard to know how old the roof is. Documentation around that is is not very good. Right. Uh, and we can make best of knowledge type representations, but insurance company uh, roof adjusters really know their business. And when they get up there, they're going to know if you've made an accurate representation to them or not. Um, and then, um, service line, uh, your service line and buried service lines, it's sometimes referred to, is the connection between the house and the city water and the city sewer systems. Those degrade over time. The older your property is, the greater risk you have of either being required by the city to dig it up and repair it, or you just need to do it because it's degraded, cracked, has roots growing through it, and it is broken apart. Uh, that's always the financial responsibility of the property owner. So you can, uh, most uh, insurance companies offer either five or $10,000 of that coverage for an additional premium. So those are some of the things that uh, become part of the conversation too. Absolutely. So if we kind of look at this, if we zoom out a little bit and we think about in summary, somebody wants to get into real estate, they want to rent out a single family home, become a landlord. They're looking at landlord insurance, which is going to encompass some of the things that we talked about and just general cost. I know it's going to be hard to tell because, um, you know, depending on the size of the property, depending on the location, et cetera, et cetera, it's going to be hard to tell the exact numbers, but is there a rough way to estimate how much they're going to have to pay in a premium to be able to get all the coverage necessary to be able to rent out their property safely? Yeah. So, uh, obviously the, the aging condition of the property matters. Um, also, the, the the credit of the applicant for the insurance matters. Um, you know, low low or poor credit risks, poor credit scores correlate to higher incidence of claim filing. So, insurance companies uh, factor that into what they charge. So, just expect that. You know, if, if you have great credit, then you're going to get some benefit. If you have poor credit, then that's going to be part of your your insurance pricing reality. Um, but uh, Apart from, you know, condition and age, you know, location is a factor. Uh, crime score is a is a um, rating factor. It's not a uh, real um, real out there and and uh, advertised in the application. It's just kind of something that's taken into account behind the scenes by the insurance company. So that's a factor. Uh, so. If you reduce it to a cost per hundred of insured value, it can range anywhere from, I'd say, um, 35 to 60, 70 cents per hundred. It, it depends. Um, actual cash value policies are not necessarily less expensive than reconstruction cost policies. The, uh, the, the dwelling coverage amount may be lower, and so you would expect that the premium would be lower, but the rate oftentimes will be higher on an ACV policy than it will be on a reconstruction cost policy. It's not always the case, but it's surprisingly often that that is the case. Okay, that's really helpful. And then the last piece here is, you did touch on this before, but I just wanna make sure it's clear if somebody is looking to rent out a property that's more than a single family unit, maybe it's two to four units, are they going to be looking at any additional pieces of coverage for their policy and or is the price going to to change drastically or is it going to be similar a similar calculation to what you just described? Uh, so the math is very, very similar, but you know when you have four bathrooms and four kitchens in a four family, you know you've got a little bit different exposure. Sure. Uh, so. 
So different coverage there, or just you're just basically adding adding on. Uh, you're just adding on, um, and the agent needs to make sure that they're clear that uh, they're selecting the right drop downs. And you know the default is single family, so you better select the drop down and make sure it's you know two family or three or four family, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, you know. Yeah, it's little things like that that can make a big difference for sure. Yeah. Awesome. I really appreciate that. And I feel like there's so many different directions you can take this conversation in when it comes to insurance, because it really can be, at least from my perspective, it seems like it can be complex. So as far as the single family, just buy and hold, single family rental, those are all the questions I had in that regard. I do want to move on to the next scenario that I had in mind, which is something that we deal with more often as private money lenders. And this is what if someone buys a property and they want to fix it up and then rent it out? What kind of coverage do they need when they buy it and when they fix it up? Sure. So uh, there's there's kind of a, a a range of approaches here, but basically you're you're starting with well, how long is it going to take to fix it up? You know, if it's just really minor cosmetic type things that can be done in a couple of weeks, uh, then you just go straight to a landlord policy, and and if there's um, uh, an available endorsement for, you know, under construction, you know, I'll, I'll just check that box and they pick up theft of building materials or, and um, it's just notated for liability reasons. Um, but um, uh, if it's going to be longer, you know, than 30 days and 30 days is kind of an important number uh, because that's when you really need to notate it as vacant and under construction, vacant properties are just in a totally different risk category and um, and they're priced accordingly. The, the likelihood of a loss and a larger loss goes up when a property is vacant. So it gets priced that way. Um, and what, why is rent, that for anybody who might not fully understand? Why is that the case? Yeah, well, um, the day after Christmas, uh, uh, temperatures in this area plummeted and uh, you know for um, for my tenants whose vacants had uh, maybe gone someplace else during the Christmas holidays and they weren't there to keep the property warm and their pipes froze that's a pretty good example of uh, of why it's it's rated differently absolutely and that was one of the next questions was you know what does the coverage look like if they have tenants in the property while they're making improvements versus if they don't have tenants in there well, that uh, the way you pose that question is interesting because um, uh, most insurance companies do not allow uh, tenants while the while the uh, property is under renovation. They won't uh, offer coverage if there are tenants in there while somebody's fixing up a property. That's correct. So that that is the industry standard. It's not that way with every carrier, but it's um, for the few carriers that that will allow that. It tends to be more expensive, and we get into policy types that, um, you know, if uh, builder's risk is a type of insurance that is a companion to a vacant policy that covers the dwelling, and the builder's risk policy covers the construction and process, you know, the, the work done up to the date of loss and materials on site, uh, you know, certain policies can cover uh, materials that are in the process of being delivered. They can cover expediting expenses, uh, things of that nature. Um, and so we're getting a little uh, down a different path there, but um, but your, your starting point for a renovation policy should probably be to expect we have to cover it on a vacant basis. And then we go from there. Right. And that is, so that's where I was heading was to the builder's risk piece. And one of the questions that I had was, what is builder's risk insurance? You did kind of cover that there. And then what is the difference between builder's risk insurance and hazard and fire insurance? When would somebody need one or the other versus maybe both? Yeah, so builder's risk uh, comes in two flavors. One is um, it covers only the construction and process and the activities and exposures related to that. And the other is that it, it covers the whole dwelling. Um, Builder's risk by itself does not include liability protection. So if, if you don't have a vacant policy that already has liability protection and you're just layering on builder's risk, then 
you know, you've already got your liability exposure kind of addressed through the vacant policy. But if you're just looking at builder's risk only to cover the dwelling, then you're going to need a companion liability only policy from a different company. And that's certainly a thing that can be had. Um, but the second flavor of builder's risk, the first flavor being only covering the, the work and process and the activities and materials related to that. Second flavor is it covers the whole thing. And um, it's what's known as an all risk policy, which protects the dwelling against the same things that a landlord policy would, uh, but baked into the builder's risk policy architecture is the construction and process. And it goes into, depending on the provider, uh, there's some very interesting and and desirable coverages that can come along with that. Okay, great. And how does hazard and fire insurance fit into this if somebody is fixing up a property before they want to rent it out? So hazard and fire insurance is kind of encompassed in the idea of a vacant landlord policy or a vacant policy. So it covers the, the dwelling outside and in. Um, and then, um, you know, builder's risk, um, you know, if, if it it's if it, uh, if it is a companion to a vacant policy, then, you know, you're completely covered. Um, if it's standalone, then you got to make sure that, you know, you've got the right policy from the right carrier. Perfect. Perfect. I, I appreciate that clarification. The, the last piece here is this is a majority of our clients. People come to us and they want to fix and flip a property, right? So they want to buy a property, fix it up, and then sell it. They don't want to hold on to it as a, as a rental. And so for anybody who might be a little bit newer to the space, newer to real estate, is there any difference in the coverage if, they, if their goal with the property is to fix it up and sell it versus our previous example that we were just talking about if they want to fix it up and hold on to it as a rental? It's the same up until the point where it becomes occupied. So... Uh, or where title transfer to somebody else. So, um, you know, it's it's the same approach. It's the same kind of considerations for making your coverage choice and everything that goes into that. Right. Perfect. So if, if you're, if you're going to flip it, you know, the, the way it'll work is, you know, you start with the, with the idea, all right, it's vacant under renovation. How do you want to deal with that? Do you want, you know, one policy that covers it all? Is it is it better, more economically feasible to have two policies? Uh, a lot of it depends on the period of renovation and, and the scope of renovation. One thing we didn't talk about is structural changes. Uh, structural changes are out of scope for most companies that offer kind of the package of um, of uh, builders' risk or or under construction endorsement on a uh, on a vacant policy. Um, so yeah, you just got to be paying attention to that. And by structural changes, just to be clear, are we talking about adding a bedroom? Are we talking about working on the foundation? When we talk about structural issues, what's kind of encompassed in that? Uh, the answer is yes, both of those. So, so it, it could be foundational work, but usually it's defined as anytime you're moving a load bearing wall. Perfect. And we did talk about dwelling. We talked about replacement cost versus actual cash value. That was the next piece. And really, you know, the fix and flip piece was really important. I just wanted to make sure that people understood. It's really the same coverage when you're, when you're fixing up a property, you buy it, it's going to be vacant a lot of the times. And if it's not vacant, you're going to have a hard time finding the right coverage for that. If there's a tenant in there and you want to fix it up and, or if you do end up finding coverage for it, like you mentioned, Sam, it's going to be, you know, more expensive. You're going to pay for it for sure. One thing that we didn't touch on, there's a couple things here, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll start with this one. When does somebody need flood insurance? And if their policy covers water damage, this is a question I've heard actually more than more than a fair share of times. Um, if their policy covers water damage, does that mean that they don't need flood insurance? Yeah, so flood and water, let me come back to that because first I wanna be really clear on a vacant policy and actual cash value versus reconstruction cost. Okay. Vacant policies are always actual cash value, uh, unless you know the, the reason for the vacancy is uh, between tenancy. Okay, so when you purchase a property with the intent to to flip it, you're going to be insured for your purchase price plus the value of the renovations. That's how you determine 
the policy amount. Uh, so I just want to be really clear on that. Um, so for so, example, there, you buy a property for $100,000, you're going to put $50,000 of work into it, you're going to buy an insurance policy, a vacancy policy for up to $150,000. It'll be a vacant policy, hopefully with a builder's risk endorsement or a builder's risk um, companion policy and the total value would be $150,000. Okay, great. And then the next piece, uh, if there is a tenant in it, like you were talking about the replacement cost or construction costs, how does that, how is that calculated? How is that factored in? Yeah. So, uh, if it's occupied, um, you know, it's occupied and it's eligible for, you know, reconstruction cost support. Uh, the trouble is finding a carrier that allows occupancy during renovation. Right. Right. Awesome. Yeah. I appreciate that. That's, that's really important and that's great clarification. And so the, yeah, the next piece there is just, is the flood insurance and, if somebody's policy covers water damage, does that mean they don't need flood insurance? It might seem like a simple question, but it's one, like I said, I've gotten a handful of times and I just want to make sure, especially for anybody new that they don't make yeah. this mistake. Well, every property is in a flood zone. It's just a matter of your proximity to the source of the flooding. And so, um, uh, FEMA, uh, the federal emergency management agency, uh, agency of the U S government, uh, has what they call flood maps. And these flood maps are updated periodically because, you know, what's in a flood zone today uh, may be different, you know, two years from now if there's been construction in, you know, upstream that changes the flow of water, water retention in an area. So a property today that's not in a higher risk flood area could be two years from now, if, you know, as a result of, of these kinds of condition changes. Um, but flood insurance protects against uh, damage and loss due to rising waters on the surface of the earth, okay? Um, people think of flooding in a home commonly as water backup. They say, oh, my basement flooded. Uh, if, if the water, if the source of the water is kind of sewer backflow or, you know, overflow from storm sewer that swamps the sewer system and you get water backing up into your basement, that's water backflow. That's not flood. So flood plays a separate policy. Um, sometimes a uh, there's I'm, I'm aware of a, two or three carriers that offer flood as an endorsement on a builder's risk policy, uh, but I would just say you know um, as a, as an operating principle, flood is always its own policy, separate from any kind of land policy. Uh, water coverage. You know, there's three types of three basic types of water exposures. You know, you've got a leaky roof, where you know, um, you know, water seeps in through the outer structure, typically through the roof, um, uh, or you've got um, burst pipes. You've got leaking that's occurring within the walls of the house or under the floors, uh, and then you've got water backflow. That's great. And 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 uh, and again. Uh, vacant policies are, are pretty careful about how they cover water exposure. Um, you should assume on a vacant policy, water is not covered unless it's specifically added back in the application process and extra premium is paid for that to the extent that it's offered at all. Um, most carriers will offer water coverage on a vacant policy, but don't assume that it's covered. Have a specific conversation with your agent about it. Awesome. And I think, yeah, it's a great point to call out because like you used as the example earlier, one of the, you know, the big reasons why you want a vacancy policy is let's say it's wintertime, you know, just after Christmas and the pipes freeze and they end up bursting, you know, you're going to certainly want that covered. The next piece here is a little bit more, it might be more advanced for people, uh, depending on what stage they're at in their investment uh, career, but it's partnership insurance. And so just really quickly, we're not, I'm not, an attorney, I'm not, uh, I don't have any, you know, I'm, this is not legal advice, but in Ohio specifically, there are three types of real estate ownership. There's sole ownership, there's joint tenancy, and there's tenancy in common. When somebody is thinking about partnering with another individual or individuals on an investment property, so maybe there's three people in an LLC, why is partnership insurance important? Well, it's an important, uh, distinction if you're the insurance company because it gets to you know 
who you're going to be dealing with at a t- in a claim and um, and the partnership interest and how it's structured. Um, most insurance companies will write insurance for, you know, a small a one or two person LLC uh, on a personal lines basis, you know, one to four family properties. Some don't. They just don't want to, you know, it's the squeeze isn't worth the juice isn't worth the squeeze, you know, for that uh, to an insurance company. So some just say, no, we don't do it. Uh, most will. Um, so it's important to the insurance company from that perspective. But if you have an LLC or a limited partnership or you have multiple individual owners, typically that's that can be done. And what are they, what's actually covered there? So just from the perspective of the investor who's never who's never partnered with somebody on a property and they've never really considered partnership insurance, what are they, why would they end up getting partnership insurance? Why is it important for them? Yeah. So when I hear you ask the question, I'm thinking insurance uh, in the name of a partnership. It's not covering insurance, the, the risks inherent to a partnership. So if you get in a dispute with your partner, that's not the insurance company's issue. Um, and so that that's one reason why insurance companies are a bit more cautious in writing insurance in the name of a, of a partnership type entity. Um, Cause there could be, you know, unaligned interest in the event of a claim. Um, so that's why there's, there's some care around that. Uh, so one thing I will say, uh, you know, if you have partners or individuals who are owning multiple properties together, what you do find is, um, you know, you could have, people having different LLCs. They own the LLCs in common, but but these different LLCs, you know, kind of one per property or one per, you know, limited number of properties. Um, that's fine and it's possible. Uh, getting uh, layered, extra layers of umbrella protection or extra layers of liability protection, there needs to be a common thread through all of those entities. And usually it's one or more individuals who are named as additional insureds on each of those policies. So the policies can be written in the name of an LLC, but there needs to be an individual who is, an, is named as an additional insured on each of those policies to create nexus for the umbrella. That's really helpful. That's really helpful. So I do want to be mindful of your time here. I know we're coming up towards the end. Um, so there's a couple of quick questions that we can just kind of, we can kind of wrap up with. And the first one is when somebody calls you for insurance on a property, and we can keep it simple and just say that they're renting out a single family home, for example, what kind of documents or information are you going to need? I know we've talked about some of them, but if we just want to start from the top and keep it, you know, relatively simple for people who might be making this phone call for the first time. Sure. I just need, you know, their full name, their current address. If they've had some changes in their recent address history, I need the last two years of their addresses. Um, need their email and phone number, you know, really basic stuff, date of birth. Um, because when uh, insurance quotes are run, then uh, prior loss history is, is obtained as part of that quoting process. And we need those data points so that we're pu- so that the insurance companies are pulling correct information from the ISO. The insurance services organization, where it's a, it's a big repository of loss information and prior insurance history information. So we need that, and then we need you know as much information as possible on the property being covered. We call that the insured location. So you know information about the insured location, and if you are going to be making structural changes, uh, many times we'll need you know signed design plans from an architect or engineer. Um, but if it's just your basic interior cosmetic, exterior cosmetic, we don't really need that. Uh, just a good list of the script, uh, list of the, the updates and what it's going to cost. And then, uh, a time frame for completion, whether it's occupied or not, what's your time frame for occupancy or sale? You know, um, how many other properties you own can be a factor, um, and what your prior uh, loss experience has been is always relevant. Awesome. Thank you for that. And uh, I know this has been a, a pretty technical episode. I've asked a lot of specific questions about coverage and policies. And for anybody listening, I know, um, you know, 
that stuff I think is super important. And I think this is stuff that we get questions about a lot. That's part of the reason that I put this together and why I was really excited to talk to you. So I appreciate you bearing with me as I kind of throw questions your way. One of the you know questions that might be, I don't want to call it more fun necessarily, but uh, less technical is, you know, what's the biggest mistake that you've seen uh, that, you know, a client has made or what's the biggest risk that somebody runs when they are getting insurance if they're not properly insured? It could be, you know, take it either way. Yeah, I, I think it's being underinsured, you know, uh, having too little insurance to cover your exposure. Uh, so people are always interested in managing costs and I want to help them manage their cost. You know, it's, it's a great thing about being a broker is, you know, you have access to a wide range of carriers whose appetite is, is going to vary. And so their pricing is going to vary as a result of that. So we'll help identify, you know, the, the, the carrier that offers the best value for you, but there's always a temptation to minimize the premium by insuring for too little. So I think that's, that's the biggest mistake potentially. Absolutely. And it's a, you know, it's, it's heard in, in insurance and outside of insurance, but it's one of those thought processes where it's, it can, it would never happen to me. It might happen to other people, but it might never happen to me. And I know that, you know, I don't have to tell you, but you see stuff happen all the time. I like to say, I want to be your best friend on your worst day. If your worst day is defined by an insurance loss, then you're going to appreciate having worked with me to get you in the right insurance. Awesome. And then next question is just out of curiosity, and maybe there's somebody who's listening to this that wants to become an insurance agent and work specifically in the real estate world. What's your favorite part about your job? Oh, I love working with people, you know, um, and I, I love educating people. Um, you know, when, when I can help somebody expand their knowledge and understanding and, and get them into the protection that they want, that may sound kind of geeky, but that's why I'm in this business. Um, you know, I love problem solving. And these are, I, I do puzzles every day and these are puzzles. And I like to know the different you know, elements of it and see how they all fit together. Um, and, you know, it's, it's about building relationships and even friendships, you know, over time. Uh, yeah, that's, that's why I love this business. Awesome. Yeah. I heard uh, somebody else who's in the insurance world, like in insurance in what they do to a game of Tetris, every time they're putting together a policy and trying to fit the pieces together. And then the final ones, how can anybody add value to you today? Um, you know, just um, promote good business culture, right? Uh, do the right thing. And I think we all help each other when that is our way of, of doing business. Um, you know, don't be afraid of the difficult, you know, response to, to a question. You know, it's, uh, it's the easiest response in the end. And uh, just, you know, be committed to having, uh, you know, bold, honest explorations on your way to getting the solution. That's how you bring value. Sam, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us today, for, for being so well equipped to answer some of these questions that I threw your way and for taking out of your time, taking time out of your schedule to be here. I know you have a lot going on. We were talking about that before we started the show. So I'm really grateful for it. I appreciate it. Where can people go to get in touch with you? They can go to goosehead.com slash Sam dash more, or just look up Goosehead Insurance Sam Moore. It'll take you to my micro site and you can even get quotes directly from that micro site. Just click on the link says get quotes now. And uh, there'll be some modifications that are, that will inevitably be required, but that's a great way to get it started. Uh, and then my contact information is, is there also. Perfect. And I'll leave all of Sam's information in the description below. If you're listening to this and want to get in touch with them, Sam, thank you so much again. I'm really glad that we, we crossed paths at the real estate meetup that we, that we met at. So grateful for your time. Yeah, me too. Thank you again for having me. Of course. Thanks everyone. We'll catch you in the next one.